live from high atop the Aubrey Plaza Plaza in beautiful downtown Wilmington, Delaware. We are the Podcast Pediatricians. I'm Matt Gotthold. And I'm Rob Walter. Check us out on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, a whole bunch of other places, as well as podcastpediatricians.com. So today, boys and girls, we're going to dive into an, an incredibly complex realm inside pediatric medicine, and that is genetics. And oh my goodness, I don't think there's been anything in our pediatric careers that has changed as much as the role of genetic testing. It seems to touch almost all aspects of pediatrics, and its current status seems to be only scratching the surface of what the future holds. So obviously, we can't include all thing genetics in our discussion today. This subject becomes so complicated that one might argue that we should leave it to the experts, the geneticists, and not talk about it at all. But... That's never stopped us before, has it? <laughs> no, it has not. But and especially this time, this we should time. really get deep into our disclaimer here, right? Listen so, to this. We listen discla- closely. We disclaim because everything. Because we're not going to be responsible for this, folks. We are sharing our own personal opinions on pediatric care. Always talk to your own pediatric caregiver about your child. Pediatric caregivers should always consult expert guidelines and consider their own community standards of care. Okay, Matt, we can't do this podcast without addressing the elephant, the little elephant in the room. And by that, I mean the absolute dumpster fire of an ending of the season for the Eagles. And the last episode, they were like, you know, they were 7-1 and one on the way to 10-1. and one. Uh, Could you even... God awful, dude. So, so I don't even know where to start, right? I mean, the secondary was completely absent, right? Uh, e- e- even, even All three levels of the defense were All three gone. levels were just horrific, right? Gone. You know, we, started a lot, we started the season with probably the most stout defensive line you know uh, in, in the nfl and and it just melted um it was just well, horrific we knew that fletcher mm-hmm. cox and brandon graham were old but it turns out they were old <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah and and you know more and more has come to light uh about how uh you know perhaps jalen hurts is uh, persona is a challenge for some of the other players and that he is so stoic and kind, uh. of de- kind of detached and you know on the one hand i respect that you know he's he's there to do his job he's focused but i think that you know from a leadership standpoint you know you got to be a little rah-rah i would think right yeah it was just it was it was horrible i know the, the, the super bowl was good yes and and i you know your listeners you don't know this but but uh matt is obsessed with taylor swift so <laughs> that that really saved the season for him because he was always like taylor swift did you see taylor swift it's, i've never even I'll heard of him football now <laughs> <laughs> okay so let's talk about the a couple things in the news rob do you remember our 21st podcast we recorded that at the end of December in 2017. Holy moly, that was a long time ago. Over five years ago, actually. It was titled The Phrenotomy Epidemic, Tongue Ties, Lip Ties, Buckle Ties. Oh, oh my. my. That's right. And in that episode, we sounded the alarm on the spectacularly disturbing rise, seemingly overnight, in the diagnoses and incredible expensive procedures that are being done by some dentists on very young infants under the outrageous claim that those procedures were necessary and helpful for infants and moms struggling with breastfeeding. Please note, we are not discussing classic tongue ties, which are relatively rare and which we as pediatricians were all trained to recognize. But instead, we're discussing the situations that most pediatricians agree are entirely overblown. These diagnoses being made by some lactation consultants and dentists and can result in pricey, painful, risky, unnecessary procedures. Well, the New York Times ran an in-depth article on December 18th titled, Inside the Booming Business of Cutting Babies' Tongues, How Dentists and Lactation Consultants Around the Country Are Pushing Tongue Tie Releases on New Mothers (laughs) Struggling to Breastfeed. Now for us... This was nothing new. Nothing new. Nothing new. The article detailed how pediatricians around the country have, like Rob and I, been unnerved by this turbocharged tongue surgery epidemic. Some pediatric ENT surgeons, those who train in long fellowships in order to be familiar with and perform surgery on infants and children's mouths, are completely enraged by this phenomenon. Many of these ENTs trace some of this unnecessary surgery to an article that was published in 2014 in the newsletter of the American Academy of Pediatrics, which suggested that more babies may benefit from tongue releases to release more subtle tethers at the back of the tongue and of those between the upper lip and the gum, beyond the releases traditionally performed for classic and restrictive tongue ties, done with a simple set of of surgical scissors. I mean, old school pediatricians used to do this in the office, right? Absolutely. 
This letter did not claim to be scientific and was presented as exactly what it was, an anecdotal observation. And yet, it seemed to become quite influential. Yeah, and this Times article and the daily podcast they did this week provided many scary examples of procedures of this type that resulted in tongue damage and dehydration as a consequence of pain endured by the infant during the procedure. In fact, local pediatric ENT Dr. Nicole Aronson was cited in the article and talked about an 11-day-old infant who she cared for here in Delaware who was hospitalized for dehydration following a laser procedure done by a local dentist here. So the laser machine used in these procedures can cost upwards of $80,000, but this pales in comparison to the potential profits. Last spring, a manufacturer of these lasers hosted a conference in Arizona attended by 100 pediatric dentists entitled Tequila and Tongue Tie. Nice. Where the attendees were served tequila shots while being trained in laser tongue tie release technique, as opposed to the years of ENT training. (laughs) There's a ton of money to be made since most insurers do not reimburse dentists for this, so it's largely a cash business. Interestingly enough, There's no compelling evidence at all that even for most of these tongue ties that a laser release has an advantage over a simple scissor release. One of the biggest proponents of tongue tie release noted in the article is a lactation consultant who reported that she was converted to the idea of the procedure when she herself had the procedure done in her 40s and she said it improved her scoliosis, her migraines, and her acid reflux. Basically, it seemed that her response to anyone saying that their baby is fussy is that it's probably a tongue tie and that it was missed by the pediatrician and this procedure could take care of it all. (laughs) Did she see tax advantages to it or (laughs) did it increase her 401k substantially after she had her tongue tie released? Holy moly. Sounds like a panacea for all the illness, right? Now, let's take a step back for a minute. By no means do we want to infer under any circumstances that there are not some infants who have substantial tongue ties to the extent that the anatomy clearly has the potential to impact the effectiveness of breastfeeding. We are even willing to admit to the premise that there has been the very rare instance in our practices where we have seen an upper lip that was severely tethered by a labial frenulum, an upper lip tie that hampered breastfeeding. In my 30-plus years of practice, and Rob's there and then some, I can count (laughs) these infants on one hand. One key to making an appropriate diagnosis in these rare situations is having a good lactation consultant determine the impact of this anatomy on the infant and the mother's ability to breastfeed. It's becoming increasingly clear to us as pediatricians that we need to make sure that the lactation consultants that we direct our families to do not have direct ties to any of these laser dentists. Many of these dentists also seem to have relationships with chiropractors and craniosacral therapists who purport that their services can help with the effects of an infant with a tongue tie. Of course, there's no science at all to back this up, just internet social media driven anecdotes. <laughs> Rob, we like science, right? We do. Mr. Science is our yes, friend, Mr. right? Wizard, Mr. Wizard. Yeah, because a jumble of pseudoscientific drivel to rip off our patients' families is not okay. I feel better now. I've been holding that in for a long time, you, man. You really have, you know, and probably you said it a little bit more forceful than I would have. And I know I've had kids who have seen some of the laser dentists around mm-hmm. who I trust my lactation consultant, mm-hmm. and it's made a difference. They also now are mostly taking insurance. Um, mm-hmm. And since we did our original podcast back in 2007, 2017, I did have a patient who appeared to have a restriction of the buccal mucosa inside the cheek and the gum on that side. So, you know, I had to laugh because we all talked about we've never seen a side tie. So maybe so once in 30 plus years, I saw that just once in 30 plus years. And I sent that baby to be valued by someone I trust. And services, again, were legitimately reimbursable by health insurance and was taken care of. But again, that was rare. Getting back to actual science-based topics, based on research, let's touch on COVID vaccines and RSV preventative antibodies. Although many have become glazed over on the topic of COVID and kind of it's exhausting, it's still out there and will continue to be a potential source of danger for humans for the foreseeable future. 
While it's true that COVID and the recent variants of it don't seem to have had the same catastrophic events as it had in recent years, it continues to pose a threat. By most estimates, deaths related to the COVID-19 epidemic are in the 7 million range worldwide, with over a million of those in the United States. As of last week, over 1,600 people a week were still dying of COVID in the U.S. So it's not gone. As we've learned, there are types of viruses that are constantly changing, like the flu. A vaccine that may have worked well in the past may not work as well now, which is why vaccines need to be changed and addressed as the virus changes, like with the flu. The most recent statistics available demonstrate that on average, those who are not vaccinated at all against COVID-19 have a four times risk of dying from it than those who have any vaccinations against it. Much better odds for vaccinated, especially in the high risk group. Dare we mention the COVID booster vaccine, Robin? Mm, I don't know. Mm. I'm scared. Yeah. It's recommended for six months and above by the CDC and the American Academy of Pediatrics. But I think that less than 20% of those eligible have actually gotten it. You know, and at this year's ROI Warren seminar, a keynote speaker, none other than Dr. Paul Offit, the guru of the science of vaccines and co-inventor of the rotavirus vaccine, which saved so many lives around the world, He spoke on COVID-19 vaccine lessons learned in the past three years. He detailed the science of the vaccines beautifully and had two comments that really stuck out to me, both of which could be construed as being a bit politics related. And we try not to get political on this podcast. Our politics are children here. Yet these were interesting coming from the vaccine expert and certainly from a proponent of vaccinations. The first was that he felt that the greatest accomplishment of the Trump administration was Operation Warp Speed and the creation and manufacture of the mRNA vaccines, even though it appears that Mr. Trump does not like to talk about these successful vaccines at all. But another interesting comment by Dr. Offit was that he was disappointed that the Biden administration was eager to go all in on the COVID boosters for everyone before the science of the work was completed. To support his opinion, he noted that if a person who is not high risk completed any of the original Wuhan strain vaccination series, then they're still really well protected against severe COVID and hospitalization. He noted that getting the COVID booster did not really add much protection if the person already had one of the original vaccine series, and that actually the booster did not reduce the chance of getting reinfection by that much except for specific groups, the elderly, those with high risk factors, and perhaps very, very young children. Which for us as pediatricians gets to the question we are asked in the office by parents. All the time. Do you think my kids need to get this new booster? Again, both the CDC and the Academy of Pediatrics say yes for everyone six months and above. It's hard not to be in sync with the AAP on this, but we have been known to go off script from the AAP at times. If a parent wants their child to get the booster vaccine, then I am all for it. If they're not sure, I tell them that the booster is a very reasonable thing to have. But if the child or their contacts are not in a high-risk group, the data does not necessarily support the necessity of getting the booster, except maybe in kids under two years old. What do you think about that, Robbie? Same. That, that's what I'm saying also. And I must admit, I do not go out of my way to bring up the topic of the COVID booster with some of my families in my practice who I know will say no, which is very different in the approach I have to other vaccines, where even though they'll say no to some of these basic vaccines, they know that I'm going to bring it up, Mm -hmm. and they can say no again, but they know that I feel like as a pediatrician, I need to bring it up. A related scary thing that we've been witnessing in our offices since the COVID pandemic is more and more families refusing the flu vaccine for their children. Many of these people never refused the flu vaccine before, And their reasons are usually pretty vague and somehow connected to the idea there's too many vaccines or less concern about the risk of flu. But even beyond the flu, we're seeing some families who understood the importance of the basic vaccines in the past now refusing some of the most essential vaccines we have available in our arsenal against infectious disease. Vaccines that have proven to save innumerable lives over the course of many decades. It's a strange mindset, and it's difficult to decide the best way to address it. Like most pediatricians, I fear that we will be seeing an increase in deadly disease that have been easily prevented in the past by these effective vaccines, and they'll start to bubble up in our communities, fueled by the unvaccinated children. It's very scary. 
we recently had a small measles outbreak touching both the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and Nemours Children's Delaware. And this week, a measles outbreak's in Florida where the health official, their surgeon general in Florida, has told the family they don't need to isolate their child for 21 days if they're exposed to measles, that they can still go back to school, which goes in the face of everything we know about measles and the fact that measles is the most contagious disease known to humankind. If someone with measles goes in a room, stays there for a minute, then leaves, and then someone a few minutes later comes in who's not vaccinated, they have a 90% chance of getting measles. And while it's often can be mild, sometimes it can be fatal, especially with pneumonia in young babies, also with brain um, inflammation. So our medical officials are now not following the silence. And I know it's Florida, so maybe we put that in a different category, but uh, it just, you read that, my blood boils. Again, you know, all you have to do is go back to the basic premise of what you and I have uh, have practiced for 30 years, science. Yeah. You can prove things in science. Yeah. All right, yeah, this is really scary. Did you get the most recent COVID booster? I yet? actually, mm-hmm. I did in November, especially since I see my 91-year-old mom, and I also take care of high-risk kids. And I'm in my 60s, but I look a lot younger than you. <laughs> 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 I'll, I'll I'll challenge that one at some other date. <laughs> <laughs> Yet another immunization-related topic involves the availability or lack thereof of the long-lasting monoclonal antibody shot for RSV. The pediatric version is called Bayfortis, as we mentioned in our last episode. Remember, it's not a vaccine that stimulates an antibody response. It is passive immunization. My practice luckily had a pretty good supply of these shots, But many pediatric practices have not been able to get it, including some of the practices affiliated directly with children's hospitals. We're happy to have it and to administer it to our babies under six to eight months of age. And we were actually able to give some extra back to the hospitals who had some really high-risk kids. But it is a black mark against the pharmaceutical production system that they didn't make enough of this product to meet the need and demand. Luckily, many pregnant moms recently have been able to get the new RSV vaccine that's given in the last trimester. And this then gives immunity to their babies when they're born for the RSV season. So you don't need to give the Bay Fortis if they've already had the mom getting this new vaccine. But what we don't know is what's better, the mom getting the vaccine in a late trimester, third trimester, or if we give the babies a monoclonal antibody. No one knows for sure, but we need to figure out what's better for next year. So, so switching topics a little bit, the flu has arrived. A recent commentary in the journal Pediatrics declared it was the author's opinion that antivirals were not being used for influenza as often as they should be. I disagree, I think. <laughs> I continue to believe that there's no compelling evidence at all that the vast majority of cases of proven flu that the antivirals, particularly Tamiflu, make any substantial difference in either the interim or the outcome. And I will say that I've recently changed my mind on this, uh, actually since the, since we put the script together, Rob. So I went back and looked at the uh, the information that I had based most of my opinion on, which was the Cochrane reports. But essentially, a bunch of really smart, independent docs who look at information and decide whether it's valid. And the Cochrane report that came out on Tamiflu was there's no uh, indication that this is um, helpful, right? But somebody else looked at it. I believe it was the FDA uh, here in the U.S., but it essentially said, hey, listen, when the Cochrane Group was looking at this, they were looking at Tamiflu's effect on flu-like symptoms. They didn't actually prove that those people had the flu, right? So right. when you look at people who have PCR-proven flu, apparently there is some advantage. Mild, but some advantage. So so I, I, I've, I've taken a step down. I just told my partners the other day at our, at our meeting that um, it's something that I'm willing to consider in certain cases. I respect the fact that you're telling me that I was always right and you were wrong. <laughs> I didn't and that, exactly that's, say that. That's kind of what I heard. <laughs> but, you know, but again, it's only if it's in the beginning, the first day or so of symptoms, and it's proven by PCR. But it's not a panacea. And uh, we're actually starting to see less flu the last couple of weeks. I don't know about you, but it's yeah, kind of died for down. sure. Remember that on our last episode, we talked about the not for profit. Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, a.k.a. CHOP, and some insane compensation numbers for their leaders. Remember that? I do. Well, recently Delaware's big 
nonprofit hospital, Christiana Care, which is the primary Delaware hospital for newborn deliveries, including high-risk deliveries and those needing neonatal intensive care services, settled a whistleblower lawsuit to the tune of $47 million. A lot of dollars. Yeah, that's a lot of dollars, man. This lawsuit has been kicking around for about five years, and it concerned a situation where, between 2010 and 2014, private practice neonatologists were billing insurances, particularly Medicaid, for neonatal intensive care services that were being performed by hospital personnel, including neonatal nurse practitioners, often without those neonatologists actually present in the building. I do remember that when I was pediatric residency director in the 90s, how upset many of these neonatologists were when they were told the residency program was eliminating much of the time that the residents spent doing neonatology. And honestly, the residents were spending a full nine months in the NICU during their residency out of a 36-month training program. And the NICU experience was great, but if they wanted to do more NICU, then do a neonatology fellowship, which uh, many of them did. So all these shenanigans came to light when a former chief compliance officer, Christiana Care, filed fraud claims under the Whistleblower Act and was later fired. And that former chief compliance officer will get $12 million as compensation. Obviously, I don't think this would be rewarded if all his claims were false. And I'm sure he had to go through hell after being fired and then working with lawyers for years prior to it being settled. So, okay, lastly, Matt, before we go to our break, I've been reading about slang words of the Generation Alpha, which are people age 14 and below. That's Generation Alpha. And I'm going to give you a sentence to translate. It was from an article in the New York Times by Madison Kircher. So ready? What does this mean, Matthew? Sticking out your guillot for the Rizzler, you're so skibbity. Where do you find these things? <laughs> <laughs> this this topic is like a recurring obsessive theme for you. Um, are you reading Teen Beat? You know what was it? Tiger Beat. My sister know. used to read that right. when the Bay City Rollers were. Sean around, Cassidy right? would be. On yeah, the, uh, yeah, oh, the perpet- right. yeah. I have no idea what that means, man. It doesn't sound very okay. flattering. <laughs> okay, so so guillot rhymes with yacht, and it means. Big butt. And Rizzler is someone with a ton of charisma, so you do, you do want to be a Rizzler. And Skibbity means nothing, but it comes from the animated series Skibbity Toilet, which has run for 69 episodes on YouTube. So counting our podcast pediatrician bonus episode, this is also our 69th episode. So we are just like Skibbity Toilet, although not. Yes. The show is about a war between human-headed toilets and hardware-headed humanoids. And if you're listening to this and curious about watching it, do not watch it. I did watch it, and I wish I had not watched it. So be afraid, very afraid. What made you want to watch that, (laughs) Mr. Skibbity? Skibbity toilet. Skibbity toilet. We'll be right back with genetics, which will perhaps help us to explain your toilet-shaped media watching sensibilities. Wait, wait, wait. wait. I have some breaking news to tell you, Matt. I Uh am engaged. Whoa! I asked Susan to marry me. I'm walking across the room to kiss him on the head. He's going to kiss me on the head, which is kind of a Jewish thing to do. Uh Okay, ready? Mm -hmm. Ah. Mm. I didn't so, even leave a slobber trail. I asked uh, me. I was shocked that she said oh, yes. But here's the best part, which I yeah, told I'm shocked people. she said yes, So <laughs> we went to one of our famous spots with Hayes, um, yes. puppy, and uh, got down on one knee, and she thought I fell. <laughs> <laughs> which would be powerful. for the I course, know, right? right? <laughs> She's like, are you okay? You're okay? No, I'm like, I'm doing this on purpose. I'm getting on one knee. Give me a chance. So, yeah. So, anyway. Oh, good for you, man. Thank you. Thank oh, that you, thank fills you. my heart with joy for you. Really. All right. Really and, and truly. And awesome. We truly will uh-huh. be right back. Indeed. Bye. That's all. We are back. So, Hot Topics at Disney World in 2023 last summer had, for the first time, a section on genetics, which... Matt wouldn't know about because he didn't go this year. Oh, well. But these presentations starred both Dr. Nina Powell Hamilton, our geneticist extraordinaire here in Delaware at Nemours, and Dr. Deborah Rieger, the chief of genetics and metabolism at Children's National in D.C., and the program director of their medical genetics training program, who's also an international leader in rare disease genetics. 
The most fun part of this genetic session, at least for me, was our hot controversy topic, which was whether or not there should be universal exome sequencing of all newborns. You may remember last year we talked a little bit about the Boston Sequencing Project, where whole exome sequencing was done in the Well Baby and NICU units in Boston. It involved around 160 babies with about the same amount as controls, and they were evaluated for evidence of genetic variants for over 1,000 childhood onset diseases, as well as for highly actionable adult diseases, including 33 types of genetic cardiovascular conditions and 28 different genetically linked cancers. The goal of this preliminary project was to explore the medical, behavioral, and economic impacts of integrating the results of exome sequencing into the care of healthy and sick newborns. For example, it's believed by scientific researchers in the field that universal exome screening on infants would likely reduce pediatric cancer deaths in the United States by at least 8%. So I don't think it's a stretch to think that in a few decades down the road or sooner, providing this type of information to parents may become a routine part of what we do as pediatricians. We'll likely get a report of exome sequencing for an infant prior to seeing these newborns in our office. It's hard to discuss exome sequencing without a little background on genetic testing. I'm sure none of the listeners really wants to hear the two of us do a deep dive into the nitty gritty of genetic testing, but, but it, that's, that's never, never stopped, stopped us before. before. So maybe we won't go that deep since we each have a limited understanding of this stuff ourselves. But a quick overview of genetic testing, starting with a basic karyotype test, which simply looks at the number of chromosomes and the shape of these chromosomes. This test can determine conditions such as trisomy 21, also known as Down syndrome, which we will talk about in more detail later. It also can diagnose trisomy 13, trisomy 18, which can be life-threatening conditions. Most people have 46 chromosomes found as 23 pairs of chromosomes, and each of these trisomy conditions has an extra chromosome, so they have a total of 47. A newer genetic testing breakthrough involves the fact that several of the more severe trisomy syndromes that Rob just mentioned can now be screened for by cell-free DNA testing using a pregnant mom's blood. This type of testing can be done as early as 10 weeks of gestation up through the time of delivery. It's a simple blood draw as opposed to the more invasive and risky type of testing known as chorionic villi sampling or amniocentesis. This test can be performed due to the fact that up to 6% of the free-flowing DNA in a pregnant mom's blood can be from the fetus. At this point in diagnostics, this test is considered to be the best for the diagnosis of trisomy 21, trisomy 18, and trisomy 13. But it is kind of amazing that you can test the mom's blood and make these diagnoses. It's so non-invasive and non-risky for the mother or baby, so it's really a big... uh breakthrough in genetic testing. Another relatively common genetic test is called chromosomal microarray analysis, CMA. It's a microchip-based test which allows for the automated analysis of many pieces of DNA at once. This technology can be used for the detection of clinically significant microdeletions or duplications with a high degree of sensitivity for submicroscopic aberrations. I think many of us pediatricians are familiar with this test because it seems to be the test of choice for evaluating children with suspected autism and other forms of developmental delay. Obviously, not all kids on the autism spectrum will have a genetic abnormality identified, at least not at this juncture of our capabilities, but more and more atypical genetic patterns are being discovered. This type of testing, CMA, is also used in cases in which the patient is found or suspected to have multiple congenital anomalies or intellectual disabilities or in testing for syndromes like Angelman syndrome, Williams syndrome, DeGeorge syndrome, and Prader-Willi. The limitation of CMA is that it may miss some novel or rare genetic variants. And then there are the gene panels which I think we've both seen ordered more commonly by pediatric subspecialists over the past decade or so. These panels are useful for evaluating children and adults with specific phenotypes and clinical presentations. 
So what are gene panels? What are they, Matt? What are they, Robbie? Well, let me tell you. Gene panels are collections of genes that have been scientifically arranged for testing. This presentation enables the simultaneous sequencing for all the genes known to cause a particular disease, syndrome, or phenotype. These panels may include anywhere from two genes to over a thousand genes. For example, there is a macrocephaly panel. So macrocephaly is unusually large noggin, right? To study those with unusually large heads. There are also gene panels that can identify certain types of epilepsy, hearing loss, immunodeficiencies, short stature, and skeletal dysplasias. There are gene panels for certain cardiac conditions and for certain metabolic muscle issues, just to name a few. And this brings us to another type of genetic test, whole exome sequencing. That's what was used in the Boston Sequencing Project. Whole exome sequencing involves examining 98% of the exons in our DNA. And to be honest, as impressive as that sounds, these exons account for only about 1.1% of our total DNA. Exons are locations of our 20,000 plus genes that code for proteins. Abnormalities in protein coding by these exons is the source of the majority of genetic problems. So whole exome sequencing is the process of examining these exons, again, only 1.1% of our total genome. This process looks at each of these exomes about 100 times, which is called 100 depth. The turnaround time of this type of testing is anywhere from days to months. The success rate for finding a meaningful answer from a given set of exons is about 25%. The present cost of this testing is between one and four thousand dollars. Most of the cost of this type of testing is due to the efforts being made to determine the variance of unknown significance, also known as VUSs. Remember that term, variance of unknown significance. Many of these variants can be discovered if the investigators know what they're looking for, that is, looking for certain symptoms or phenotypes. But if the test is just a blind screening test with no specific indicators on what they're searching for, it's much more difficult to determine the meaning in figuring out the thousands of VUSs found on the exons. So, you may ask, what about the other 99% of the genome besides the exons? Well, some of the remainder of the genome includes the introns, which are the areas in between the protein coding exons. Introns account for about 24% of our DNA. The other roughly 75% of the DNA is referred to as intergenic DNA. This is the stuff that's floating around in between the genes. As you may have guessed, whole genome sequencing looks at everything, including the introns and the intergenic DNA. This is a tremendous amount being examined, about 99 times more DNA than what is examined in a whole exome sequencing and includes 98% of the exons of whole exome sequencing. In this type of testing, each area can be examined only about 30 times, so referred to as 30 depth, which is far less than the 100 times depth used for looking at exons with whole exome sequencing. No surprise that these variants of unknown significance, VUSs, that were found in the thousands when looking at just exons are way more numerous when all of the DNA is being examined. It's been estimated that there may be millions of variants of unknown significance. Obviously, whole genome tests take longer, generally months to even years, and the cost for this type of testing can be upwards of $30,000. And for all that effort, the success rate of finding meaningful genetic answers is only 32%, or just 7% higher than whole exome sequencing. Now there's an ongoing learning curve to this technology. As time goes on, more people participate in genetic testing, the tests will get more and more accurate since more of the unknowns will be identified as potentially meaningful or not meaningful. This eventual increase in identification will reduce the number of those variants of unknown significance. More genetic diversity in the populations being tested is necessary to achieve this, particularly to get more in minorities and in poverty-stricken areas around the world. Most of the existing database is from more affluent Western populations. However, I've read that China may be developing its own huge gene bank, although perhaps for more nefarious reasons. So now we get to the hot controversy debate. 
on universal newborn whole exome sequencing. The scenario given to doctors Rieger and Pal Hamilton and the audience of pediatric caregivers was that a mom in your practice is asked to participate in a large prospective study on whole exome sequencing for their newborn through a major medical center in order to search for rare childhood diseases and actionable adult diseases. This is like the baby sequencing project. This mom asks your advice on the wisdom of having this done. You are given these options for your responses. A, yes, this will be the future of pediatrics and may help to prevent life-threatening problems, including cancers and heart problems in their child. B, maybe. There are many pros and cons of this opportunity, and I just don't feel that I can give an opinion either way. Remember, this is the pediatric caregiver answering this mom's right. questions. And C, no, your main concern is that the newborn cannot give informed consent while sharing their most personal of data. D, no, this needs to be done on many adults before we move to the routine sequencing in newborns. And E, no, I don't think routine exome sequencing on newborns is a good idea. And when we polled the audience before we started the debate on these questions, 25% said, yes, this is the future of pediatrics. I think you should, the parents should enroll their baby in this program. 53% said, B, they just punted and said, maybe um, I can't keep an opinion either way, which is reasonable. This is all new. And about 5% said, C, no, there's now newborn informed consent, and that's a problem. And about 17% said, E, no, I don't think this is a good idea. So overall, 25% said, yes, do it. 53% said, maybe. And 22% said, no, about allow, telling a mom to let her child be in this kind of genome sequencing program. And then the debate began. We should mention here that Dr. Rieger and Dr. Pal Hamilton decided in advance that one of them would prepare slides on the benefits of this type of screening and the other prepare slides on the risks of this type of screening. Then a coin would be flipped as to which geneticist would argue which side of the issue. As it turned out, they argued using the other one's slides. It was very cool that they did that, showing that pediatric geneticists are very cognizant of both the amazing and wonderful possibilities of this technology as well as the scary, uncomfortable Pandora's box that may be opened. The presentation on the benefits of this screening started with the case of a two-year-old girl whose father died suddenly from a ruptured aortic aneurysm. Exome screening of this child showed a variance of COL3A1. It was argued that if the girl's father had the benefit of newborn genome sequencing, his death could probably have been prevented. At least now, healthcare providers can observe the little girl closely and prevent her from dying from an aortic aneurysm. It was explained that this type of newborn screening can find many dominant mutations that could be expressed in a given child and even more recessive mutations. This type of information could be invaluable for future planning for having children. This type of testing is also able to identify 5% of kids who are prone to atypical responses to certain pediatric medications. She then explained that universal exome screening is capable of discovering metabolic diagnoses prior to them being symptomatic, and facilitate early, appropriate management to reduce morbidity and mortality. As exome sequencing becomes more universal, it's going to get less expensive and shorter time to confirm diagnosis. It will have the capacity to alleviate pain and suffering in parents by having them know early about significant problems. It will reduce the number of those variants of unknown significance and let us get closer to personalized medicine by providing a wider database of genomes. The more information accumulated, the more accurate things become. This realm includes personal pharmacogenetics, with the capacity to discern which medications would be the most optimal for a given disease for a specific individual based on their own unique genetics. Despite discussing the many benefits of universal newborn whole exome sequencing, she finished by stressing that most of the subject gets back to education, specifically pre-test and post-test counseling. Currently, most of this is done at pediatric centers. So then came the other geneticists with the presentations on the risks of this newborn screening of genetics. In summary, the risks of universal whole exome screening were broken down into five points for not doing the universal screening. The first point involves the diagnostic uncertainty numbers. 
This factor includes all of the variants of uncertain significance, as we've been discussing. It also includes the degree of stress that the information can cause a family when there's the possibility that there may be a positive test for a certain condition without actually knowing whether the individual have the condition. If millions of babies are tested, this translates into millions and millions of possible uncertainties. The second point when considering the risks of universal whole exome screening involves the potential lack of healthcare providers available to manage this information and its translation for the general public. If there are 1,240 medical geneticists in the U.S., which is the most recent count, and there are 1.8 million variants of unknown significance, meaning we don't know what this gene means, estimated to exist per year with universal exome sequencing in the U.S., then this translates into 1,450 variants of unknown significance per geneticist per year, or an average of 28 variants of unknown significance per geneticist per week. In addition to this, these will translate into at least 320,000 new diagnoses, with or without symptoms, for a total consideration of 258 situations for each geneticist. And even if in the future the roughly 54,500 general pediatricians in the United States were the ones addressing many of these issues of the 1.8 million variants of unknown significance per year, that's 33 of these per pediatrician or one of these every two weeks. So as a primary care physician, I'm not sure I can address this need. However, while some say that only healthcare providers who are extensively trained in genetics and genomics can be helpful in addressing this complex information and decision-making associated with it, it has been shown by examples in the even recent COVID um, pandemic, that we general pediatricians can adapt to new information when it's presented to us and it's clinically beneficial to our patients and families. It's not a stretch to consider that we could learn to use and interpret this kind of information when there's a lack of other available geneticists to do these tasks. Another example of this in recent years is the willing of many of us to become educated and practice in prescribing mental health medication options, something most of us were never taught to do during our formal training. Her third point when considering the risks of universal whole exome screening involves the fact that the underlying diagnostic uncertainty of this test affects high-risk populations the most. Currently, the variants of uncertain significance are known to be much more common in ethnic and racial minority groups than they are in Caucasian populations. So universal screening would create more uncertainty and distress in a population where children are already at risk for health disparity. Which is a very good point. And her fourth point is that we cannot assume that this type of genetic screening is what the patients and parents actually want. 15% of the families of inpatients at Children's National Hospital who were offered genetic testing for their acutely ill children with the goal of potentially being able to diagnose what was causing the illness did not want the testing to be performed at that time. My guess would be that this rate of refusal number would even be higher for random families who do not have an acutely ill child. The fifth and last point when considering the risks of universal whole exome screening involves a lack of knowledge of the long-term benefits of this type of testing. Long-term benefits for the patient and their family cannot be assumed. The testing may put a patient in jeopardy for obtaining health insurance or some specific benefits. There may be discrimination in the context of other types of insurance based on the results of this testing, for instance, car insurance, life insurance, disability insurance. Even if there are legal protections against this type of bias, a family may not understand those protections. The testing might affect an individual's career options, for instance, for the military. In researching this topic, I found an interesting article in the British Medical Journal by Bicycler and Curtis in 2021. In this article, some interesting points were made concerning newborn home exome sequencing. The authors observed that we as a culture have not yet even agreed that this type of testing is optimal for adults, where treatment benefits could be dramatic by applying strategies to the diagnostic information obtained through this type of genetic testing. For instance, young adults being screened for genes linked to certain cardiac diseases, 
colon cancer, breast cancer, or ovarian cancer. So if we're not pushing universal screening on these young adults, then why should we be pushing to get it on babies? And if this type of testing is done for babies, should we restrict the search to the small number of conditions where it's agreed that the testing can provide real immediate benefit to them? The authors also mentioned that companies which perform screenings could realistically retain personal genetic information on people without their informed consent. And then there's the issue of finding information on conditions where there's currently no specific interventions or cures. There surely are some adults who would want to know situations like this, but a good ethical argument can be made that the effect of this type of information may not be good for a child welfare growing up and their parents. They ended by asking if we cannot decide whether or not adults' genomes should be sequencing, then we should not be asking whether it should be done with children. So after the hot topic debate ended, the audience was asked the question again about advising a mom on whether or not to have whole exome sequencing done on her child. And the results were surprising. The A, yes response, that is, this will be the future of pediatrics and may, may help prevent life-threatening problems, including cancers and heart problems in their child. This yes response increased slightly, from 25% to 27%. The B, maybe response, that is, there are many pros and cons of this, I just don't feel like giving an opinion either way. This went down significantly from 55% to only 13%. The C, no response, with the main concern being that the newborn cannot give informed consent while sharing their most personal of, of data, went up significantly from 5% to 27%. The D response, with the logic that this type of testing needs to be done on many adults before we move to routine testing on newborns, went from 0 to 1%, so still not a comment. The E, no response, due to not thinking routine exome sequencing on newborns is a good idea, though, went from 17% to 31%. So in summary, after listening to the debate between two pediatric geneticists, the overall percentage of pediatric caregivers in the audience that disagreed with having whole exome sequencing done for the newborns went from 22% to 60%. Wow, right? That was a huge uh, movement of the needle there. It's quite Indeed. fascinating. Now... We all know it's hard to stop the march of progress, like the promising but frightening advancement of artificial intelligence. Hopefully, 50 years from now, we will not regret the decisions we make about genetic sequencing of newborns. At the end of the genetics discussion, I asked the audience of pediatric caregivers what they would do if this was offered for their own newborn, this screening. And 56% said they would do it, and only 25% said they would not do it. So kind of opposite of the advice they would give to other families. And I don't think this is saying that they're being two-faced about it. I think that they would feel that they are much better well-informed. Right. And so they can make this yeah. decision. I think that's the crux of it. I think I think that we as pediatricians are oftentimes laboriously contemplative about how well uh, the folks that we're counseling are going to understand a topic that took us years to understand. And so, so we feel like we're in a better position sometimes to make these uh, these kind of controversial decisions. Um, but we don't necessarily want the folks in our care to have to make decisions when they haven't been fully informed, and especially with a with a with a new technology. But that could hit some parents the wrong way. It could. Bottom line of the room is, what would you do with your baby? Right. And so that's so, why it has to be explained, It right? does. Mm -hmm. It does. Okay. We'll end our genetics episode with some highlights from Dr. Powell Hamilton's update on Down syndrome care. Most general pediatricians take care of patients with Down syndrome. For us, this is typically a very rewarding and inspiring effort. It's impressive to witness how the patient's family, particularly the patient's siblings, seem to grow into a more mature perception of the world that the world is not always fair and does not treat everyone the same. Being close to a person with special needs can encourage a person to a more broadly inspired service-based mentality as part of their worldview. There are several specific medical conditions that are associated with Down syndrome. A major association is congenital heart disease, often endocardial Cushing defects. If an infant is determined to have Down syndrome while in utero, a fetal echocardiogram should be performed as well as a postnatal echo. Hearing issues are also a common problem, so it's frequently necessary to have an ENT specialist involved early. There 
are often subtle upper airway anatomical differences in a person with Down syndrome, including the eustachian tubes in their functioning, which cause frequent ear infections. Ear tubes are common. GI issues, such as duodenal atresia, can occur, and up to 19% of individuals with Down syndrome are on the autism spectrum. Families expecting a child potentially with Down syndrome should have genetic counseling, and Dr. Powell Hamilton wisely pointed out that if a family is found to be expecting a child with Down syndrome, the first thing we should do in the initial discussion following the diagnosis is to congratulate them on expecting a child. She stressed that mention of potentially terminating a pregnancy not be part of any kind of conversation during these first discussions unless the parents bring it up. As we mentioned earlier, trisomy 21 can be suspected but not confirmed very early and non-invasively in the pregnancy with a maternal blood test looking for free fetal DNA as early as 10 weeks of gestation. The most recent health surveillance guidelines for Down syndrome that are recommended by the American Academy of Pediatrics include obtaining thyroid stimulating hormone levels at birth because of the high risk of hypothyroidism, and then also once every six months during the first year, and then annually thereafter, but every six months for a lifetime if thyroid antibodies are found. An ophthalmology exam is also recommended by age of six months, and then annually thereafter due to a high rate of vision issues in children with Down syndrome. Due to an increased risk of leukemia, getting a complete blood count and a differential by day three, then annually, with tests for iron deficiency and immediate testing anytime if significant bruising, bleeding, bone pain, or recurrent fevers occur is in order. Both of us remember ordering cervical spine neck x-rays series on our patients with Down syndrome prior to them participating in organized sports remember or that? Special Olympics. I do. Yeah. This was to check for atlanoaxial subluxation which is the misalignment of the first and the second cervical vertebra, which can occur with neck flexion and which increases the risk for spinal cord injury when participating in a variety of activities. We no longer routinely order these x-rays unless there are myelopathic symptoms, suggesting a compression or an injury, or if there are neurologic symptoms, especially a loss of toileting skills. Children with Down syndrome have a mild to moderate intellectual disability and higher rates of mental health issues, especially anxiety and OCD, than in the general population. They need academic support and should be encouraged to stay active. We want to put in a plug here for a uniformed high school Sports programs where kids with physical and intellectual challenges are paired with kids who don't have these challenges in sports like basketball, soccer, and volleyball, and it's, it's a wonderful program. Something that surprised me about the current guidelines is that it's no longer recommended to obtain routine celiac screening in children with Down syndrome. I understand they're evidence-based, but I, I, I personally have had two kids in my career with Down syndrome who are asymptomatic, who were diagnosed with celiac yeah, with this screen. I think I've ordered. had three. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, and that was a recommendation for a long time. We do the screening with a tissue transglutaminase IgA level, verified as being valid by simultaneously getting a quantitative IgA level. I think this diagnosis has a notable clinical impact on their health. So, one of those times, I think for both of us, we're going to go against the guidelines and continue to check children with Down syndrome for celiac. Damn straight. Lastly, Dr. Powell Hamilton emphasized that we need to consider the risk of obstructive sleep apnea in these patients. Checking for this used to be based on symptoms, but now the recommendation is that all children with Down syndrome have a sleep study between ages three and five years of age. These studies are never a pleasant experience. Most parents would say they're a horrible experience. If shown to have sleep apnea, they may consequently need to have their tonsils removed in an attempt to address this. But if it's not resolved with tonsillectomy, then for them, often CPAP doesn't work either. And in some of these kids, hypoglossal nerve simulation seems to work best, especially in the younger ones. An important practical aspect of our care of children with Down syndrome or of others with long-term self-care limitations, includes encouraging these families to consider estate planning and transition to adult care early on. In addition to discussing Down syndrome, Dr. Pal Hamilton also had an excellent discussion on genetic visual diagnoses, and specifically mentioned Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and its multiple subtypes. 
She noted that if a patient demonstrates only hypermobility and does not have easy bruising or a family history of aneurysms, then no other genetic testing or referral is usually needed. And this comes up often. It does come up often, right? And I used to all send him to genetics. I don't necessarily do that anymore. Okay, one last fascinating piece of advice from Dr. Powell Hamilton um, that she mentioned was that if we suspect a syndrome in a patient, there is a new facial recognition software that's available. Our previous old-fashioned go-to here was painstakingly paging through Smith's book on recognizable patterns of malformations and then saying the child to our friendly neighborhood geneticist. But there's this app in the cell phone called Face to Gene. Do you have this app? I do not. I do I do have this now. And it can be used by pediatricians in our office. A picture is taken of the child's face and then processed by an algorithm that indicates the child would benefit from a genetic evaluation. Basically, if there's a reasonable chance that she might he or she might have a genetic syndrome. And it's potentially quite useful. This app could be useful in helping us to evaluate children with growth issues, developmental delay, intellectual disability, autism spectrum or if they have a sense that the child has dysmorphism. The old, I hate to say this out loud, we don't say this anymore, but FLK, funny-looking kid, mm -hmm. that we're in the room and it's a hard conversation, like, let me see a picture of dad. But they may show you a picture of dad, and he may look like that, but dad may have a syndrome too. Right. So we've both been in that situation, right? You're like, eh. Oh, yeah. So they're kind of coarse and looking at them. So here's this face to gene thing, and you take a picture. I did this once, and it came out positive. Wow. So they're seeing a geneticist um, in a few weeks. Huh. So hopefully it'll all be normal. But I'm going to use this on you, Matt. Okay, so are you I've saying I'm an here. FLK? No, no, no. I'm just saying I have it now. I'm gonna take it. Ready? Smile. Gotta get your whole face. Excellent. Okay. Then they get sent. Um, it's pretty quick. I've got a, I've got an answer. It says that you have Quaro syndrome. Quaros. K O R O. Huh. Never heard of it. I never heard of it. Uh, we'll figure it out. I hope out. I survive right. my sixties. I hope it yes. does too. All right. <laughs> That's all for now, gang. Uh, say good night, Maddie. Good night, Moon. Podcast Pediatricians Productions. All rights reserved. <laughs>